Good afternoon. Uh, today I have the honor and privilege to introduce Professor Joe Handelsman to the University of Waterloo community. Professor Handelsman will receive an honorary doctorate during convocation tomorrow. Uh, she did her undergraduate training in agronomy at Cornell University and her PhD in molecular biology uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she is currently. Uh, she spent much of her career in the Department of Plant Pathology in Madison, then spent some time at Yale University. From 2014 to 2017, she was Associate Director for Science in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And she recently ret returned to Madison as director of the new Wisconsin Institute of Discovery, which is a transdisciplinary research institute exploring information across disciplines at the interfaces of research, education, and business. Throughout her career, in addition to running a dynamic and influential research program in the areas of plant microbe interactions, uh, metagenomics, she actually coined the term metagenomics, uh, and the microbiome in agriculture, environment, and human health, Professor Handelsman has been a tireless advocate and leader in science education, mentorship for women in science, and for science policy and the role of science in society. As scientists, we need to never lose sight of the wonder of science and the role that it plays in making our world a better place. So please join me in welcoming Professor Handelsman to University of Waterloo. Well, thank you, Trevor, for the wonderful introduction and for the invitation to be here. Uh, this, sorry, this visit is, has been a few years in the making because of my time in the White House that uh, limited how much I could travel for academic reasons. So it's nice to be free of those constraints. Um, and speaking of the White House, I bring apologies from the United States. <laughs> and I will not say more on that. Today, I thought I would talk about my White House experience and uh, the microbiology going in my, on in my lab now, um, because people always ask me about the White House, and so if I don't give a talk on it, then people are, are uh, upset because they're really curious. And, but I want to talk about my research, so I thought I would talk about how what I did in the White House actually influenced the microbiology that I'm doing now. And, um, it's, it's an interesting route because usually we think of scientists bringing their scientific expertise to the White House, uh, not the White House bringing science to their lab, and it does work both ways. So I'll talk uh, just briefly about uh, the White House and how the Office of Science and Technology Policy is set up, um, <clears throat> and then I'll talk about one of our initiatives just to give you a taste of the kinds of things that we did in the office when I was there. And then uh, I'll talk about three areas, very briefly about functional metagenomics, um, and just as an example of the kinds of studies that are done in some areas. And then I'll talk uh, mostly about uh, where I see microbiology going. So I was asked to be uh, President Obama's uh, science advisor uh, as associate director for science. So I ran the science division of the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And I was the only biologist among uh, the uh, four leaders of the four divisions. So I handled, and, and uh, the only one doing basic science, so I handled all of the basic science, biology, physics, chemistry, a uh, fair amount of engineering, agriculture, and most of the big um, telescopes and uh, the super uh, collider in CERN uh, and various other big instruments that are used in science. And the Office of Science and Technology Policy is intended to uh, advise the president on science, first of all, manage uh, science and technology as it arises. And we had several crises while I was um, in the White House, including the Ebola epidemic and the Zika epidemic, and then many other not quite so uh, urgent things, but that arose, like gene editing, became a very popular topic in the White House that uh, needed to be addressed. And then every year we would advise and advocate for the science budget and work with the people who actually developed the budget to uh, ensure that the things that we thought were important were being supported. Uh, we also were tasked, tasked with increasing the visibility of science 
and the value of science for um, the American people and the rest of the world, and also to look ahead. And this was in some ways the most challenging and interesting part of the job, and that was to figure out what are we not doing that we should be doing. And that meant a lot of conversations with the scientific community, a lot of reading, a lot of studying of areas to see where the big trends were, trying to figure out where there were gaps that perhaps we should take responsibility for filling. And that was a very, that was a new function uh, to me. I didn't realize that the government was as proactive as uh, it has traditionally been. No comment on the current uh, situation of science in the White House, but at least in that White House and many White Houses before Obama, uh, there really was an effort to think not just about what we should be doing now, but to be pushing the fields by uh, acquiring funding and support and visibility for new fields. And then we had a large uh, collection of committees, task forces. We ran the Presidential Medal of Science, um, various other uh, award processes. So it was a very varied job. No two days were alike. Uh, no two days were quiet. They were all filled with bustle and projects and people. Um, and probably the most exciting ones were when the president himself asked us about something that we were supposed to be expert in. And sometimes we were expert and sometimes we had to become uh, sort of expert. And one of the fun things about becoming an expert was that you had the entire uh, country and probably the world, uh, because I did actually use Canadian scientists and they always answered the phone, uh, at your disposal because when people heard it was the White House calling, they would always try to help. And I got an incredible amount of uh, learning done on the phone with various scientists when new issues would arise in agriculture, in human health, uh, or fundamental science. And people were very generous. And I, I remember about a year ago calling somebody who uh, I had always had very uh, quick conversations with. I was able to reach very easily when I was in the White House. And her assistant said, well, she can talk to you sometime next month. And I said, OK, I'm not in the White House anymore. <laughs> so uh, that was one of the real privileges that one had access uh, to many, many um, people. Um, so. Um, so I thought I would talk about uh, the National Microbiome Initiative, which was something that my division, the science division, developed for President Obama. The microbiome happened to be something he was particularly interested in, and every time I saw him, he wanted to talk about the microbiome, no matter what the uh, topic at hand was. And um, his aides were quite irritated with that because uh, they didn't understand the appeal of the microbiome. But he was absolutely fascinated and had all sorts of theories about his own microbiome because he had grown up partly in Indonesia and, um, and in various other places that he was sure had probably influenced his microbiome. So um, that was always an interesting part of the job to be um, sort of owner of an area that was one of the president's um, pet interests. So uh, with the National Microbiome Initiative, we uh, had a, a process to bring in the microbiome community from across the U.S. And, uh, and then a few from outside the U.S. to have meetings and tell us where they saw the, f the future of the microbiome going. And we had a feeling by the end of the process, we, I think we probably brought physically to the White House about 70 scientists over time in groups, individually, uh, and then we talked to many more. And we got the feeling by the end of it that the, that the ideas were actually shaped, that what people came to us with at the beginning wasn't what we ended up with at the end. And that suggested to us that we had actually generated a process that was developing a new vision for the microbiome uh, and really looking uh, forward at where we could go and not where any individual lab was right now or planned to go in the next few years, but where the field really needed to go. So uh, many of our initiatives would be culminated in a White House event which was partly because we could bring a lot of uh, attention and uh, good, serious press to scientific issues by having events at the White House. Uh, they would automatically get covered. So it was a way to get the microbiome talked about and written about uh, in the press. And these events were also times when companies, foundations, individuals, and uh, federal agencies would all make commitments to the area. 
And it would, gave us the leverage to have sort of an endpoint or uh, a, a target for when they would announce a uh, certain commitment. And in the end, even though we we're announcing things that other people were doing, it turned out to be a lot of new money for the microbiome because these were commitments that probably, in some cases, many cases, wouldn't have been made otherwise. They would have been made to other fields or per even to different aspects of the microbiome. And so we announced uh, initially about a $200 million set of commitments, and that was the combination of all those uh, sources. And some of those continue on today in the private foundations and even in the federal agencies. Some of those initiatives um, uh, move, move forward. And the theme that became apparent during these meetings that we had on the microbiome was that we needed to elucidate the fundamental principles that govern all microbiomes. And to achieve that, the argument was that we needed to do comparative microbiomics, if you will, and find the similarities. If we could find principles that would explain behavior of one microbiome for perhaps, say, the human gut, and would also apply to the ocean or the soil microbiome, then those were probably the general principles of microbiomes that we were looking for. And so the challenge was getting the agencies and the foundations to move out of their little ruts, because most of them were committed to one type of microbiome. NIH, National Institutes of Health, funds almost all human microbiome work. And they weren't real excited about um, putting some of their funding toward oceans. But we convinced the entire community that was engaged in this that that actually was the future of microbiomes, that there was as much to learn in other microbiomes about whoever, whichever microbiome was of your main interest um, as studying your own microbiome directly. And so we started several programs that uh, asked for proposals that looked across microbiomes, so taking a single question and studying it uh, in, a, in a lateral way across microbiomes. Um, so that was, uh, I think, a really exciting initiative to learn about, to interact with the scientific community about, and to really formulate a plan for, and that's what I'll talk about in a couple of minutes. Um, that really had an impact on my future science. So um, another area that we were very involved in that the White House had actually not had advisors uh, in this area for several years, and so this was something that had been kind of languishing, was agriculture. And so we developed uh, an initiative on pollinators. One of my staff developed uh, a really fantastic program that looked at uh, the demise of bees across the world. Um, and brought together this, this very mixed coalition of 40 different companies and uh, private foundations uh, that do the companies being the chemical companies that provide chemicals to agriculture, some of which have been accused of being the cause of the demise of bees, and then foundations that are involved in um, environmental protection. And so you might imagine that this would be uh, you know, a conflagration waiting to happen. And I was really impressed because the staff member who did this managed this meeting uh, in a very, very uh, deft way that ended up with everyone learning something. And the companies were grateful for it, the nonprofit environmental groups were, and I think some, some real action came out of it. And something actually that's happening today that uh, is still going on and I hear is, is actually about to begin is turning one of the big highways in the U.S. into um, the monarch butterfly highway. So there's one highway that follows the migration path of the monarch butterfly from the north border of the United States uh, down to Mexico. And uh, we were going to designate that the monarch butterfly and line the entire highway with the um, monarch's uh, favorite food, milkweed. Common milkweed is its uh, favorite habitat. And the Department of Transportation, federal department, uh, agreed, and they started working with all the states involved, because of course there are many states from uh, top to bottom of the U.S., and, and they actually are starting to initiate that. So that was actually really satisfying that um, it was something that seems like the kind of thing that might not survive into another administration, but in fact it did. Um, some of the uh, other really exciting things we did that, that I knew very little about, uh, and so it was a great learning experience uh, for me, was 
um, were the science management uh, issues. In addition to the various initiatives uh, on particular areas, there were the overarching things. So one was the President, uh, President Obama, from the very first day he was in office, uh, talked about open access to data being important. And in particular, he focused on scientific data. And so we had all of the agencies that fund science develop data management plans uh, so that all of the data generated with federal funding would be readily available. And you can imagine that this was quite a challenge because the agencies do business in very different ways. We don't have a single science funding agency. Um, and they have very different constituents, the scientists, in different fields, and they have different challenges in storing their data. Um, in, in the genomics field, we're very comfortable with making our uh, gene sequences available uh, through databases because we've done that for a long time. In other fields, I discovered that's anathema. They, uh, they do not want to share their, their data. Um, we also worked on the reproducibility issue. There's been a lot of challenge to science about why studies sometimes can't be replicated uh, or the, the results are not replicated when the studies are supposedly repeated. So we had several task forces on that. And then an area that I didn't know much about was scientific integrity, which I thought I, I knew what it meant, um, which was scientists having integrity. But in the White House, it has a different meaning. It was uh, that we shouldn't be using uh, political means to manipulate scientific messages. And I was amazed, and this was something Obama was totally passionate about, and we in OSTP were also uh, incredibly dedicated to. But I was surprised at how many pockets of uh, challenges we found to scientific integrity. Uh, and I'm sure that it's not just in the US. I'm sure this happens every place where a scientific message is not seen as popular um, by a certain agency and that message was um, suppressed in some way. And I was actually uh, the target of this, uh, that our USDA, which manages agriculture, was very upset with my initiative on soil because I, um, I'm a soil scientist. I worked on soil for 30 something years. And uh, I was shocked to find that soil integrity was, to use a, a different uh, purpose for integrity, um, was really under threat way more than I thought. Uh, I thought that the legislation we had passed in the 80s had really solved the erosion problem for the most part. In fact, that's absolutely not true. We're eroding soil at 10 times the rate at which it's made. And there are areas in the United States where that number is way larger, like we're eroding it 100 times faster than it's made. And so by the end of this century, we probably in the US won't have soil left on which to farm. And there will be areas that will be out of, well, some areas already are out of soil. And there will be areas, many areas, and vast acreages um, that will be out of soil by uh, 2030, 2050. You can, you can plot it. So I developed a series of projections. And USDA didn't want me advertising these. And so they actually maligned me. They said really nasty things about me, uh, argued that I was using bad data. Well, I was using their data, so um, they should have liked that. Um, and they, um, they tried to undercut my credibility. And so I actually never got to launch exactly the science uh, or soil initiative that I wanted to in the White House. We did launch a soil initiative, uh, but it didn't have the broad support uh, across government that I would have liked. And as much as I gave um, books on soil to the president, um, it was not a presidential initiative, it was a White House initiative, which meant that he was not uh, directly involved. And that, I thought, was uh, as a result of this integrity issue, that uh, as much as I wanted to move this forward, there was an agency that didn't want the message out there, because it basically they felt it reflected poorly on them that they weren't doing their job of protecting soil. And there are reasons why that's not what it says. Uh, it, it wasn't their fault, it was Congress's fault, but that's another story. So uh, scientific integrity became a really important uh, issue to me. And you know there weren't a lot of cases of it, but I was appalled every time I realized that it was happening. Um, and of course, that's happened even more since we left office. And there have been you know, just egregious reports of EPA scientists in particular 
um, not allowed to say what they had planned to say at meetings, having to cancel their talks at meetings uh, because their message is inconsistent with the administration's belief system. Um, so the difference between the two administrations was that the suppression during the Obama administration came from much lower down and President Obama was absolutely committed to openness and integrity and uh, honest messaging and being tied to the data. Um, and that, unfortunately, uh, is not true in the current White House um, science attitudes. We also uh, revised the common rule, which is the regulation that uh, controls how we treat human subjects, which is a very uh, important and large uh, issue for people doing human research. That, again, was extremely contentious. They started it just about the, the day that Obama took office, and I believe it was the very last thing he signed before leaving office, and we barely got it through. Uh, before the end of the administration. So that was the other lesson, was finding out just how difficult some of these things are. And when you read a rule or a regulation, you have to realize how contentious it might have been. So the product you're reading may not be anybody's favorite product, but it's a compromise. And that's unfortunately part of science policy that I had to accept, that there aren't simple right and wrong answers for a lot of science policy. And so sometimes you're putting forth policy that you don't feel is your best effort um, or the best you could do, but you have to work with a lot of uh, agencies to get something done. Uh, one of the things that I also discovered was how many agencies have to be consulted on these issues. For the common rule, there were 17 agencies that fund human research. In the microbiome, when we asked how many agencies would like to be involved in our microbiome initiative, um, we immediately got 15 volunteers. And I never could have named 15 agencies before uh, I was in the White House that had an interest in the microbiome. But everything from the Air Force to EPA um, to the Department of Transportation, I mean, it was just incredibly broad how, um, uh, how broad the, the support for microbiome research and the interest in it uh, was. So that was also an interesting aspect that, you know, you might think that one agency is uh, the home of all of the research or the policy or the regulations in a particular area. And typically in American science, it's not true. Um, so uh, that was one of the challenges, but also a really important thing to understand. Um, so this is the rough structure of um, the OSTP. Um, we had four divisions uh, that dealt with various aspects of science. Science was mine. I put in the honorable there because uh, John Holdren, that's John here swearing me in, uh, he was my boss um, and the top science advisor to President Obama. And he said, you know, you don't get to take very much away from the White House after you've been in this office. You have to leave all your papers and your files and everything there. He said, but the one thing you can take is the title honorable, because if you've been confirmed by the Senate, which I was, then you automatically get this title and it's for life. So he said, use it whenever you can. So I, I mention it just because I promised John I would. Uh, so some of the other uh, initiatives, um, Okay, so, um, so the, I want to go back to the um, emerging view that we have today of microbiomes. Just, I think a lot of this audience is very microbiological, so I won't go into a lot of this, but I think the last 15 years or so of microbiome research have shocked many microbiologists in terms of just how far-reaching the effects of the microbiome uh, are. And we know now in human health that there are all these amazing associations between disease and health and the, the uh, complexion of the microbiome uh, with diseases that we never dreamed would be uh, associated, like asthma. No one really made that connection until recently. And now it seems like that's a very um, significant piece of the uh, etiology of asthma. Uh, environmental health, climate change, of course, um, is uh, greatly uh, managed by the microbes, and food production and agriculture certainly as well. So the last 15 years have really brought microbiology to the fore in a way that we, we didn't see in previous years. 
Um, when I graduated from my PhD program, I remember people thinking that microbiology was kind of a dead field, that you know, we had learned everything. And it was not that long after that we started discovering uh, just how much we had been missing in the unculturable organisms. And that led to a resurgence of interest in microbiology and, and really a, a sense of discovery that there was a lot more there than we even knew existed, let alone understood and could describe at a mechanistic level. And so uh, we thought very hard about if microbiomes are going to be usable for some of these purposes, to change human health, to reduce uh, the effects of uh, industrial development on climate. If we're going to be able to change microbiomes, we need to understand them uh, in a way that will give us reliable and predictable tools. And we don't have those now. They, you know, when, you, when people ask, well, what can I do to make my microbiome healthy? We have very few lessons to offer that are supported by research. And that's changing rapidly because it's such an active field now. But we decided in the White House that this was really one of our top priorities was figuring out what would uh, allow us to study microbiomes uh, and really understand them at a functional level. So I want to go back now to my own research, which um, before I went to the White House uh, was shaped very heavily by this uh, sort of revolution, the renaissance of microbiology in which we understood for the first time the extent of the unculturable populations that had been pretty much ignored for 150 years of microbiology. Uh, and then how the White House um, process has shaped uh, what I think are the key issues for the future. So we know that uh, there are enormous challenges with studying these complex systems. Uh, the human microbiome, for example, is, has at least 100 and probably closer to 1,000 times more genetic complexity than, um, than the human genome. And so, you know, just by basic um, statistical rules, don't you usually look where the variation is to figure out uh, differences? Uh, we've been looking kind of in the wrong place with the focus on the human microbiome. Uh, just uh, by law of averages, uh, differences between people, uh, illness and health and other things, behavior, are more likely to be associated with the microbiome than our very, very similar um, human genomes. Soil is similarly enormously complex. It's probably the most complex environment on Earth. Um, we know about about 4,000 species per gram of soil, but that's any given gram of soil, and two different grams of soil will have different species. Uh, and those are, those are definitely low estimates. Uh, the, the higher estimates are more in the tens of thousands of species per gram. So there we can't even get an estimate of, um, uh, a good estimate of the diversity. And then going back to this issue that, we, that really emerged in the White House discussions, we don't have the governing principles. We think, for example, that um, we know, uh, for, for example, that fecal transplants work because they fill a void, that there's a lack of microbes um, that enables C. diff, a pathogen, to invade uh, the human colon. And when you do a fecal transplant, you're introducing competitors. Well, in fact, it turns out not to be that simple. And that's probably part of the answer, but it doesn't seem to be the entire answer. And that's one of the few treatments that we understand better than most. So we really don't have the governing principles that will allow us to predict if we uh, do this intervention, we'll see this um, clinical or biological effect uh, on, the, um, on the system. So, before my White House days, um, there was this real revolution in how we studied microbiomes using uh, first the 16S rRNA surveys. We could look at the composition of communities, what the members were, and to some degree begin to look at relative proportions of those members. Um, that, I think, really changed the way we do microbiology today because it enabled us to extract DNA directly from environments and record uh, species composition uh, in uncultured organisms. And some of those organisms can now be cultured, but many of them still can't. But at least we know that they existed. At 
some point in this process, I got frustrated with the fact that when we uh, looked at the 16S rRNA surveys, that was the only information we got was 16S rRNA, which is a great indicator of uh, phylogenetic relationships and evolutionary history, but didn't necessarily tell us something about the functionality of the genomes that the 16S gene of interest was embedded in. And so that's when we developed metagenomic analysis along with several other labs. And our approach to it was uh, to extract DNA. Uh, some people have been doing the massive sequence analysis. That's the more common metagenomic analysis. We uh, wanted to look at functional gene expression and find uh, genes that perhaps wouldn't be recognized by sequence as having a particular function. And so our approach was to take this extracted DNA and without any PCR amplification or culturing, so it was really the mass of DNA extracted from, in our case, the soil, uh, and then we inserted uh, fragments of that DNA into um, a vector that could replicate in a culturable bacterium, E. coli or Streptomyces or Bacillus, and then we would screen those libraries for a characteristic. And the characteristic that we were particularly interested in was antibiotic resistance. We wanted to ask the question whether the wild genes for antibiotic resistance, those that you find in the environment, were related to, similar to, maybe the origins of uh, the genes in the clinic. So we looked at several sites. This is a site near West, uh, it's called the West Madison Agricultural Station. Uh, this is our Alaska site on the Tanana River. Uh, these islands are, as far as we know, have never been inhabited by people, and they are not subject to um, many of the pollutants that affect our more settled areas. And then this is a lagoon in um, Puerto Rico. And we began to look for resistance to antibiotics in these metagenomic libraries built from these environments. And I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of the kinds of results. This is not in any way comprehensive, just to give you a sense of where we were on this work and then where uh, it led to uh, what we're doing now. And so we focused mainly on uh, the aminoglycosides and the beta-lactam-related antibiotics. And we found uh, several interesting things. One that uh, emerged early on was a set of aminoglycoside acetyltransferases. So these were resistance genes that modify uh, aminoglycoside antibiotics that really kind of separated from the other resistance genes in this class um, and, and lived by themselves. So that suggested that there was something different about this soil clade of antibiotic resistance genes that made them, phylogenetically at least, um, separate from the rest of the resistance genes, most of which, of course, had come from human pathogens. So that was not what we expected. We expected there to be uh, evidence that the soil was a source, a major source, of the genes in the human pathogens for resistance. But then even more interesting um, was that when we went back, this was uh, first discovered in the West Madison site. We did the same experiment with the Alaska site, and we found exactly the same clade with the same position on the phylogenetic tree uh, as the West Madison genes. So that said that across many thousands of miles in fairly different environments, one was an agricultural experiment station near Madison, the other one was this pristine island in a boreal forest, uh, there were very closely related resistance genes to aminoglycosides. And that made us really wonder, are these somehow primordial or independently evolving genes and in fact, not the source of the genes that we find uh, in clinical samples. So I don't have a good answer for that, um, but we did many other experiments like that. Um, and, and there were surprises in every experiment. And one of the things that thrilled us the most was finding new motifs of um, different kinds of um, proteins that we don't think of as common in uh, our cultured organisms. One motif that we found to be relatively common was bifunctional proteins. And we found one beta-lactamase that had uh, two domains that fit two different classes uh, of, of beta-lactamases. And they both conferred resistance to several beta-lactamases, but to different, or to beta-lactam antibiotics, but to different ones. And so the full-length gene 
actually had a different spectrum of activity than either of these domains of the protein um, when they were cloned separately. And we expected that um, the full length gene would have an additive property, but in fact it didn't. It, it changed um, the spectrum totally from the two individual ones. But these were definitely translated as a single protein. Um, Biofunctional proteins have become a little bit more common in uh, bacteria, but they still seem to be uh, more abundant in uh, the metagenomic DNA that we find than in the cultured organisms. Um, and we had several examples of these very cool bifunctional proteins, including uh, a crystal structure of one, um, which revealed some, some very interesting structural uh, characteristics. So the metagenomics was very rewarding and told us a lot about the kinds of genes that are out there when we had a good selection for them, like antibiotic resistance. It revealed new protein motifs that weren't readily found in cultured organisms. But at the same time, uh, it didn't give us a full picture of communities. It was isolated genes within a community. We could look at the membership of those communities with 16S. We could do large-scale sequencing to get genomic information. And we could get functional information from the kind of functional metagenomics that uh, I just described. But that didn't give us the principles of what governs uh, microbial communities. And so after my experience in the White House and the, these discussions that we had about the future of the microbiome, I became convinced that in order to manipulate microbiomes, you know, to really bring them to the point that they can be used for um, human or environmental or agricultural good, um, we needed to understand how they respond to various interventions. And that meant understanding microbial community robustness, which is uh, how a, a system responds when it's met with a, a perturbation or some sort of uh, disruptive event. And so the elements of robustness are the resistance of the system to change, its ability to recover from that change, and its ultimate uh, stability. And so these are the characteristics that we're particularly interested in. And I have a particular interest in the perturbation. There are many perturbations that uh, one could use, but the one that interests me the most is invasion by uh, alien organisms, uh, because um, there we could do the biology and the genetics on both sides, on the community side, to look at what makes a community either susceptible or resistant to invasion, and on the invader side, to look at what are the elements of a good invader. Uh, whereas if we use a chemical or abiotic uh, in, uh, intervention, uh, it's harder to um, do the two-sided analysis. So we've been looking at robustness for a very, very long time, more than a century ago. Um, Eli Mechnikoff, a great microbiologist, uh, who ultimately got the Nobel Prize for other work, um, did a really interesting experiment on himself. He consumed large amounts of yogurt with live lactobacillus cultures in them. Um, and he uh, did this for about a month. He was eating about a liter of yogurt a day for a month. And he found that the lactobacillus was present in his own microbiome as long as he was eating the yogurt. But within a very, very short time after he stopped eating the yogurt, the lactobacillus disappeared from his, commu the, his gut community suggesting that there was an element of robustness, that you had to keep adding this microbe for it to be, be, be present, that it didn't establish, so it was not invading. And this has been an example that microbiologists have used now for many, many decades. He didn't have an explanation for it then. We don't have a great explanation for it now. We think we know a few of the elements of robustness, but we still don't understand what it means for an organism not to be able to invade. And what is it about that community that prevents invasion and establishment of a new member? So those are the kinds of questions that uh, I would like to be able to study. And I began to realize as I was leaving the White House that uh, metagenomics alone, as important a, a tool as I think it is, uh, was not going to be um, the answer by itself. And the thing that I felt was missing the most, that I really wanted to get my hands on, was the ability to isolate variables and do manipulated experiments which are, tend to be harder 
there are ways, of course, to do it, but tend to be harder with these extremely complex communities like the soil or the human gut. And so I began to think about what do we need to do designed experiments so that we can isolate a single variable so that everything else remains constant except one variable and do it in a system that has some reality to it, that's realistic, that it represents the real world. And in order to do it in the way that I think is most interesting and tractable, just because of this is my background, it would have to be uh, genetically tractable. And if we look at the history of model systems, that's exactly what they've been able to do. From E. coli to the white mouse, um, to nematodes, to Arabidopsis plants. We can go through the long list of model systems where scientists have all converged around a particular organism as the model system. The uh, characteristics of those systems that have made them useful are that they are simpler than the system in which you might want to study whatever the characteristic is. For example, E. coli is a lot more simple than the entire microbial world. Um, but it gave us a lot of information about how genes are regulated and how physiology is managed and how biochemical um, events occur in microbial cells that even though E. coli doesn't represent the entire microbial tree of life, it certainly has been applicable in enormous ways to all microbes. And the same with uh, development and, uh, and, and mice or development and fruit flies. Uh, and many other fields of science and biology that have been uh, advanced enormously by these model systems. They're never perfect, and they never represent the larger picture completely, um, but they can certainly tell us a lot about the rest of the biological world if they're well chosen. But the common feature of all of those is that they had genetic tools associated with them. So these were criteria that we set up uh, when we started thinking about how to design a, a microbial community. So we thought it, to be useful, it'd have to be simple, but it would have to have uh, multiple species because that's the definition of a community. It would have to be genetically tractable because small molecules are um, the currency with which bacteria communicate. They would, the system would have to have a, a strong uh, small molecule component. We would want both competitive and cooperative uh, interactions because those seem to be both important in many communities. And we would want a system that had some relevance to a natural community. This seemed like a tall order, and uh, I don't believe any system will be perfect for this, but I'd like to tell you how we came upon uh, a system of three organisms, Bacillus cereus, Flavobacterium johnsonii, and uh, various Pseudomonas species, as a model system um, that approximates uh, plant events occurring on plant roots um, and, and has many of the characteristics of model systems that we um, said we wanted. So this goes back um, to about 30 years ago. One of my students set out to study the nature of changes in microbial communities on roots when the seeds uh, that those roots came from were inoculated with Bacillus cereus. We were studying Bacillus cereus at the time as a disease suppressive agent. And what he, he found some very interesting interactions, but one of the things he observed was that he would take uh, these plates of organisms that were derived from the soil, he would streak out the Bacillus cereus ones for single colonies, he would then patch them and put these patch plates in the refrigerator, and thinking he had pure cultures. And he'd come back uh, three weeks later and find that about 5% of them had these different phenotypes. And if he streaked those uh, funny looking patches, he would find that they were a mixture of Bacillus cereus and something else. And very often that something else was this yellow organism, which is Flavobacterium johnsonii. I at first uh, thought, that he was actually not a microbiologist uh, by training, and so I said, oh, you just have contamination. Um, I have now spoken to other people who have uh, observed this with other organisms, similar phenomenon, and to a person, they've all said the same thing. Oh, I thought my student was just a bad microbiologist and thought it was a contaminant. But when this was observed by several other students over about a 10-year period, I said, okay, there's something going on here. 
And so one of my students finally decided, instead of um, ignoring this and deriding it, she was actually going to study it and, um, and figure out what was going on. And so she began to isolate what uh, we call, now call the hitchhikers from Bacillus cereus. She found that uh, the hitchhikers occur uh, from root-derived Bacillus cereus, but not soil-derived Bacillus cereus, which we don't know why, but that makes it even more interesting to me. And she found that if she uh, looked at the uh, collection of organisms that she got from hundreds of Bacillus cereus, uh, she found that they, they spread over several phyla, but the vast majority were among the Bacteroidetes. And, but there were also um, some proteobacteria, as you'll see, and that becomes more important later in the story. Um, so she would also isolate as a control population or comparison just random root isolates and found um, that the co-isolates or hitchhikers had this clear distribution, the bias toward the Bacteroidetes, that the random root isolates did not. So there was some sort of enrichment um, for the Bacteroidetes in this hitchhiker population. Um, the community interactions that we knew about were uh, that obviously this was enhanced by inoculating soybean, this was all done in soybeans, uh, with Bacillus cereus that seemed to affect the Flavobacterium uh, population on roots. And that was a very early observation that there was this flush of Flavobacteria on roots uh, that had been inoculated with bacillus. Um, and we also found these co-isolates. So that got us very interested in this Bacteroidetes group uh, that contained the Cytophaga and Flavobacteria uh, organisms. So we started studying a couple of the Flavobacteria. And we found that, in fact, they would grow in minimal media just fine. And uh, so these are uh, the inoculum. Uh, three-day culture populations and then populations in um, a co-inoculated culture with whatever the target organism was plus Bacillus cereus. And you can see that in a, in a normal synthetic medium, um, Flavobacterium would grow by itself just fine with or without, and then with Bacillus cereus there was no difference. We looked at its growth in 10-day-old um, soybean root exudate, so this is root exudate from 10-day-old soybean seedlings, we found that it didn't grow at all. But if we added Bacillus cereus, it grew as well as it did in synthetic media. And that was true as well in the alfalfa uh, root exudate, so it seemed a little bit broader than just a soybean effect. Uh, and again, Bacillus cereus seemed to encourage uh, growth. So that suggested that there was some intimate relationship between these organisms. So not only was there this flush of Flavobacterium on Bacillus cereus inoculated plants, not only were the hitchhikers more likely to be Flavobacterium than any other group, but in fact uh, there was a growth effect in culture that um, allowed uh, Flavobacterium to grow in root exudate only uh, when Bacillus cereus was there. Well, we nailed that down to the peptidoglycan that uh, Bacillus cereus sloughs off, off when it grows. Um, when it divides and sporulates, it releases fragments of peptidoglycan into the medium. And we found that um, there was direct correlation in Flavobacterium growth uh, based on the concentration of peptidoglycan in the medium, and that this perfectly mimicked um, the effect of Bacillus cereus. So it seemed that Bacillus cereus and Flavobacterium, at least, had a pretty uh, intimate relationship. We then started looking at other interactions between hitchhikers, and we found this one strain of uh, Pseudomonas coriensis after a large network analysis of inhibition. So we were now looking for an inhibitory or antagonistic relationship. We found that one of the hitchhikers, Pseudomonas coriensis, um, only inhibited members of uh, the Bacteroidetes. And so these are cultures grown alone and then with the Pseudomonas. And you can see there's no orange bar for any of these organisms, and these are all the Bacteroidetes. Uh, when they're grown with P. coriensis, uh, there, there's no uh, population um, increase. So, and interestingly, all the other organisms from a very wide phylogenetic distribution from the hitchhiker community, none of those were uh, inhibited 
uh, by Pseudomonas carensis. So we set out to figure out the basis for that. Uh, here we had a Bacteroidetes that interacted with Bacillus cereus and a Pseudomonas that interacted with the representative of the Bacteroidetes. And we found that, in fact, uh, the P. carensis produces a series of four antibiotics that are all structurally related. Um, and you can see the, the structure here. And they're actually related to compounds that are very familiar to us from plants. But these have never been reported in um, uh, microbes. And in fact, the, um, the compounds that they're most closely related to are the conines from uh, plants, which are actually responsible for hemlock being the poisonous plant that it is, and um, its history is well known uh, for its toxicity to humans. So uh, an interesting relationship, some new chemistry, but most importantly, a uh, very highly specific group of uh, antibiotics that affect only members of one phylum, and that phylum happens to be abundant on roots, particularly those affect, uh, inoculated with Bacillus cereus. On top of it, it turned out that Bacillus cereus protected Flavobacterium from the uh, Coriancin antibiotics. And so you can see here that with uh, P. coriensis present or its antibiotics, we could do it either way, uh, flavor bacterium populations plummeted. But if we added Bacillus cereus, so we now had a triple uh, inoculum with Bacillus flavor bacterium and P. coriensis flavor bacterium grew fine. We're still working out the mechanism of this, but it does seem to be that Bacillus is affecting synthesis and or accumulation of um, the coriancin antibiotics by the pseudomonas. So our model community has several interactions. Um, we have cooperation, uh, positive interactions between Bacillus cereus and the hitchhikers generally. They're somehow stuck together in a manner that we haven't figured out yet. And specifically, there seems to be a growth stimulation of, uh, by Bacillus cereus of the Bacteroidetes. So that's a, a cooperative or positive interaction. There's a competitive interaction with P. coriensis, which um, uh, is, it inhibits the Bacteroidetes either in root exudate or in some cases in culture, but this happens more often in root exudate, making us think that this is something that might actually be relevant on a root. And then in another cooperative interaction, Bacillus cereus seems to prevent the accumulation of this antibiotic, thereby protecting the flavor bacteria from its effects. We also found effects on Bacillus cereus itself from several of its hitchhikers. And the first one we noticed was changes in uh, colony morphology. So this is uh, Bacillus cereus growing uh, alone. By, by itself on plates, and this is when we add Flavobacterium. You can see it produces these dendritic structures um, emanating from the colony. Similarly, P. coriensis has uh, that kind of effect, and you can see this uh, under fluorescence microscopy, um, uh, th that there's this very irregular kind of spreading uh, of these dendrites uh, and of the colonies, whereas when, um, when Bacillus cereus is alone, uh, it seems to form um, a pretty symmetrical um, colony. So this colony expansion seems to be stimulated by hitchhikers by a, a mechanism we don't understand, um, adding yet another interaction to this th three-part community. And then finally, we have uh, a community-level phenotype that the community will form biofilms on polystyrene. Not the most biologically relevant uh, condition, we admit, but it's a start. And we find that, uh, that Pseudomonas coriensis will produce biofilms, but it's much better at producing biofilms if either um, uh, Flavobacterium or Bacillus cereus uh, is present. So this is with Flavobacterium, this is with B. cereus, and even better when they're both present. And from the microscopy we've done so far, it looks like the other two are very minor components of the biofilms. They're probably outnumbered at least a thousand fold by the pseudomonas cells. So they're doing something at an almost catalytic level to stimulate biofilm formation. And that remains to be um, 
established. So this system has several cooperative and competitive interactions, including um, enhancement of biofilm formation in uh, the triple community. Uh, we also have several tools that are very useful for these organisms. We've published complete genome sequences of all of them. We have transposon mutant libraries and can do either traditional transposon uh, mutant screening or uh, in seq or TN seq. Um, we have um, some extensive mass spec metabolomics data on them, and then we have this very rapid biofilm assay um, to study their interactions. So we stumbled upon, uh, over kind of a, a period of 30 years, we stumbled upon this set of interactions, but we think that it creates a pretty interesting model system that meets our criteria of being simple, yet uh, having t tools that can uh, isolate variables, but still having some relevance to a natural system. So we're now about to do a mutant analysis to ask uh, what are the genetic elements that contribute to invasion, invasibility of a community, and the invasiveness of a member, and hopefully begin to form the basis for models that will account not just for organisms and the physical community, physical aspects uh, of the environment, but of the individual genes in the community, uh, and particularly those genes we know are important. Uh, for invasion. And finally, I'd like to thank the people who uh, did this work. So in particular, uh, Greg Gilbert made the first observations of the hitchhikers, and Brooke Peterson uh, was the one who decided to tackle it and take it apart. Uh, Gabrielle, Juan, Manuel, and Amanda have developed uh, most of the uh, community interactions in vitro that I talked about just now. Uh, the chemistry was done in collaboration with Jason Crawford's lab at Yale. Uh, and uh, I didn't talk about the uh, Puerto Rico site and the interesting findings there, but uh, that was in collaboration with Carlos Rios. And I'm enormously indebted to Eric Stab, who is a professor at Georgia, and Nicole Broderick, who is now a professor at the University of Connecticut, um, who each spent uh, a year in my lab taking care of the lab uh, while I was in the White House. And I couldn't have done the White House work or maintained my lab. One of them wouldn't have worked very well uh, if I hadn't had those two. So I'll be uh, ever uh, grateful to uh, those two colleagues and former students. The message from that is um, to faculty, be nice to your students because they may pay you back one day. <laughs> and with that, I'll stop and take questions if there's time. Is not going to play a role? Right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, every time I've made that prediction, I've been wrong. So, you know, for example, I thought behavior was one area that we wouldn't see effects on the microbiome, and I now have a project on the interaction of the microbiome and human depression. And it's clear that the microbiome plays a role there. You can actually transfer the microbiome from depressed people to germ-free mice and see depressed behavior in the mice. Um, every time we think that we have something, well, yeah, the microbes couldn't possibly be interacting there. We find that there's, there's some effect. I think it's probably overblown at the moment, the effects of the microbiome. There's a lot of hype about every correlation of microbiome and some um, phenotype of an organism or environment, and probably, uh, definitely, not all of those will end up being causal. They may be covariant, um, and they may even be outcomes of a particular condition. But the ones that have been um, really nailed in a causal way are, are quite dramatic, and so, and, and ones that I think most of us wouldn't have predicted. So I think we've been ignoring the signs for a long time um, that microbes play a role. And one very specific example is Tourette syndrome was known for a long time among pediatricians to be associated with heavy antibiotic use early in life. And they never, people thought it was the antibiotics, and it turned out that now it, it, there's a correlation with the microbiome. So it's probably the effect of 
um, made massive doses of antibiotics on the microbiome. So, you know, those hints were there for about 40 years, and we ignored them. So my guess is we're going to find that we've been ignoring a lot, but perhaps not quite as much as uh, all the press these days would make us think. Having worked with all these different groups and bringing them together, I'm wondering, and, and having the, the group working on the pollinators be so successful, I'm wondering what you would recommend when you do have these difficult combinations of people working together, what would you recommend for success? What would you advise? Well, I think one, one aspect is not all players will play well together, so you have to be selective in who you bring to the table. Um, but I think there's evidence that coalitions of people, even especially those that disagree initially, can get more done in the long run than, than groups that just agree with each other. And that's true at just about every level of human interaction. Um, there's you know, evidence that more diverse groups of any type, you can measure diversity in lots of different ways, um, produce more creative and more defensible solutions. And if you have diversity of thought, that of course um, is an obvious way of making decisions better and stronger. So I think that bringing together people who think they have nothing in common is one of the most rewarding things because as long as they're open-minded and you have to have that as starters, uh, you can really um, bring uh, very um, strongly disagreeing parties together and at least have, who have respect for each other by the end of the process and understand each other's um, points of view. And as far as I'm concerned, isn't, isn't that a benefit to everyone? Even if they don't budge their own point of view the tiniest bit, if they just understand the people who are critical of them better, at the least they'll be more able to defend themselves. And that seems like a benefit. So bringing people to the table with that kind of attitude, we're not trying to change you, we're trying to learn from you and hope that you'll want to learn from others, I think becomes a, a much less threatening way than um, what many of our strongest activist groups do, which is a much more confrontational approach. And we need that too, there's no question. Um, especially today, we, we need the people who are going after issues extremely hard because our government is not necessarily doing that uh, on science issues. Um, but, but I think um, we also need the coalitions that will really get down to working together on solutions. It's kind of a vague answer, but I think it's, it's a good principle. <laughs>